On today's show, Jalen Green and Alperin Shingun shine early against the Brooklyn Nets and how the Houston Rockets can build on that duo offensively moving forward. Jabari Smith Jr. with some defensive concerns, but how he can use his length and his size to not only help himself defensively, but also on the offensive side of the ball. The Rockets pushing the pace quite a bit more over these last handful of games. All that and more can be right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green, Alperon Shingun, and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Hey, Houston fans, I am so happy. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come, come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. The show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts and on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. The comments help a ton. As always, though, thank you for making Locked on Rockets part of your day every single day, whether it's on the way to work, on your lunch break in the gym. Thank you for making LOR part of your day every single day. Joining us now is your weekly co-host, the X's and O's man himself, Ali Khan Bijani, who can follow on Twitter at Rockets underscore insider here to break down the Rockets 118-96 loss at home against the Brooklyn Nets. They lost? I thought they won, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we got a winning we, streak here. We could do a denial podcast if you want to, and just pretend like the score was flipped. And just, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Who? I'll tell you who won. Alicon, Jalen Green on like every drive this game against Nick Claxton. What did Nick Claxton ever do to Jalen Green to warrant not one but two posters in a single game? Jalen Green was out for vengeance in this game and got got Claxton on both sides. Right, one poster in each half. Which one was be- which one was better, Alicon? The first poster or the second one? I think the second one was better. The first. second one was nasty because he went up over Claxton like it wasn't just like he got he won like it was a side-by-side kind of poster he went over Claxton that was nasty and that's hard to do Claxton's not an easy guy to exactly get a poster on I yeah. I do I do, I agree I think the second one was better let us know in the comments which dunk from Jalen Green you liked more but I I, I will say I want to give the flowers to the first one because it came out of nowhere really early on in that first quarter which we're about to talk about the big first quarter from the Rockets Jalen Green's yeah. big night some of the issues in the Second quarter of this game, the 16-0 run that the Nets went on in the second quarter with z- zero resistance from the Rockets, zero adjustments. Yeah. It's very frustrating there. And some other takeaways that we have about Alperin Shingun, Jabari Smith Jr., Tari Easton off the bench. Positive. But some positives. Some positive. We're going to yeah. be positive on today's show. But that first dunk, though, with the left hand, the way that he elevated and was able to just kind of... Ah, Jalen, Jalen Green dunks hit different. Um they, <laughs> look, the Rockets started this game out really strong. I mean, they, they finished the first quarter 32-27. Like, this was a better start than I was expecting against a pretty quality yeah. Brooklyn Nets team with a lot of really solid defenders, a lot of versatility on their roster. Mikhail the Bridges is... Right? You would think the switching would have given the Rockets issues, especially that first quarter to start off the game. But they were pretty successful at it. Jack- Jackson, what's out to you the most out of that start? I know the Jalen Green thing, but... Is there anything in particular that stood out to you from Jalen in that first quarter? Well, I, I would, I mean, just obviously, well, we, you know, highlighting the posters, but but an extension of that is just his his overall aggressiveness in driving to the basket in this game. Jalen was struggling from beyond the arc, just one of seven shooting in this game, but he had 25 points on nine of 21 shooting. He was really effective inside the arc and driving to the rim. Again, he had the couple posters, but he was good at, you know, getting to the rim, finishing in and around the basket. He started the game with kind of a drive and like a reverse layup on the other side of the hoop. And he was also, he got to the free throw line a lot, didn't convert at quite the rate you would like to see him convert at just six of 11 shooting at the charity stripe but this was like the aggressive version of Jalen Green where he realized even though he was still taking the threes he wasn't just settling for more threes or he wasn't playing like dejectedly because he wasn't making his threes he was taking it to the Nets defense and you know one thing about the free throws I want to point out he shot 11 free throws tonight 
for the four games prior to tonight's game, he only shot nine total. Nine total free throws in the four games before this, 11 tonight. It's this 10 time this season shooting 10 free throws of more. How many times did he have last year shooting 10 free throws? Only twice. So it's just, it, it's something we're seeing a lot more of, and I'm glad to see it back, especially now. Early in the season, he was getting to the charity stripe a lot. Um, but it, it's it's good to be able to see that now. One thing I want to point out from the first quarter, Jackson, just from a schematic perspective, was the Rockets were running a lot of empty corner dribble handoffs. There's no play name for it. There's no there's nothing else but to mention, but it's an empty corner dribble handoff. Now, what does what does each component of that phrase mean? Empty corner means there is no shooter or player standing in the corner. And then dribble handoff, DHO, right? Which means it's an action involving Shangun standing stationary, pitching it to Jalen coming off of uh coming off a of Shangun screen. And so why was that effective, especially from the right side? Well, because when Jalen goes left to right, he's able to get to his dominant hand and he loves attacking the right side, especially on kind of wing isolations and especially from last going back to last year. Shangun, why does he like that? Well, Shangun is able to get to the middle of the floor easier because Jalen takes the baseline, likes to go right. So it allows Shangun to be able to establish position or be effective with his push shot or hook shot if he's able to get to the middle of the floor. It's a big reason why Alperin Shangun had a pretty good start offensively. Um, he only finished with 16 points and 12 rebounds, but that first quarter he was pretty effective. He had 10 points Although, in the first quarter. And 10 points in the first quarter. A lot of that came off of the dribble handoff action empty corner. When you have an empty corner, what does that do? That basically takes away a help defender from making an easy rotation, an easy tag, an easy dig. Dig meaning just kind of lunging towards the ball. So when the, the when the corner is empty, it's a lot more space in that side of the floor to get get initiated, get get more, more, more space off the initial screen, get more space off that initial drive towards the rim. There may be bodies in the paint, but if a guy like Jalen can just create an advantage initially – he can use his athleticism and his ability to contort his body to finish, and we saw that. He was one of four, but he was able to draw multiple fouls that first quarter, which put the Nets in the bonus early. P as well was able to get going with good post positioning because the Nets were so focused on being able to defend um, uh, Jalen. And with their starting lineup, you have KPJ, who was shooting well from three. You had Jabari in the corner where he's his best at, and you had KJ cutting. That occupied the Nets' weak side defense and and it was a for me i mean it's simple schematics but just the empty corner dho with Jalen and lp to me is their best play and it's something i want to continue to see more of not only is their best play for their team but Jalen is most efficient in terms of points per possession out of different types of possessions dribble handoff is his best and lp is very good at kind of setting him up and also finding passers from the high post as well if he is stationary off the initial um, screen uh, out of the DHL. So a lot of really good takeaways from there. And I would like to see more of that moving forward. It's something we've talked about here before at the podcast is just the, the two man game between Jalen and LP. That is one really consistent, positive takeaway from this rocket season is those two guys continuing to develop their chemistry, finding different ways for them to make life easier for one another. Right? So again, in this game, the, the Nets defense was focused so much at times on stopping Jalen as the primary ball handler that LP was able to establish like a good, you know, post position, a good spot in the paint and kind of get that little shovel pass or get that pass, you know, over the top of the pick and roll and then be able to get into his array of bags, bag of tricks, whatever, and yeah. make some shots, make some, you know, difficult, you know, difficult, or I apologize, difficult buckets. There we go over Nick Claxton, right? Using his size, getting the good positioning, getting established deep in the paint and then being able to convert those looks early on. Right. So a strong first quarter from Jalen green, a strong first quarter from Alper and Shingun, that two man game shining early in the game. So what happened in the second quarter for this Houston Rockets team, what allowed the Brooklyn Nets to get back into this game? We're going to unpack that as well as other takeaways that we have from this one in just a moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by Ultimate Basketball GM. Look, I'm really loving our, our our new partner and sponsor of today's show, the new mobile game, Ultimate Pro Basketball GM. Have you ever dreamed of becoming an NBA GM and managing your own basketball franchise? Well, your dream can come true, and this game is definitely for you. Manage every strategic aspect of your team, play through the season, and lead your team to glory. You'll be responsible for hiring the right coaches and assistants, trading and training players, making draft picks, navigating your franchise through free agency, and 
and the draft and all the ups and downs of a season. All this in a challenging and realistic world. Ultimate Pro Basketball GM is completely free and playable offline. Play on the go as you want and when you want to. I'm Look, I've, I've already sunk so much time into this game. We're, we created a locked on league for it. And there's already so much trash talk flying left and right about who's going to win the titles and all these other different things. It is a ton of fun. You've got to check it out. Locked on Rockets listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probasketballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up on the app store. That's probasketballgm.com. Ultimate Basketball GM, start your dynasty today. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Ali Khan, the Rockets played what you would say is, is a good first quarter against this Nets team. It was an unexpected, unexpectedly good first quarter. They, they led 32-27 going into the second frame. And then early in the second frame, KPJ drills his what was his only three-pointer of the game. So the Rockets are up eight. It's looking good, 35-27. And then the Nets went on this run. They just went on this tear. And oh my. At no point did the Rockets. And this is this has been an issue all season long, unfortunately, with Steven Silas. Is at no point did the Rockets call a timeout. Yeah, there we go. Okay. He's Alicon signaling. I thought it was I thought he was gonna whistle me for a technical foul. I was like, what I was like, what am I doing? Am I am I being flagrant here on the podcast? No. He scores eight points in like a minute. Call timeout, man. Clearly something's going on with your rotations. Yep. Team scores 16 points in less than three minutes. And then you put yourself, honestly, in out of reach mode a little bit. When you're trying to actually win the basketball game, come on, man. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my, indeed. Yeah, and that, that run was the run that kind of just, at, from that point on, at no point after that run did it really feel like the Rockets were – ever in control of the game again. Like that was just, it, it was almost like the, the Nets had that timeout. Jacques Vaughn went, all right, guys, you got your first quarter out of the way. Let's wake up. Let's take this thing seriously. And they came out. They just blitzed the Four Rockets at the top of the second quarter. Around Nick Claxton. Yeah. And they switched everything and dared the Rockets to hit some shots. They did not. Then they got out in transition and the Rockets just did not defend. And honestly, a lot of those mistakes were just from the fact of they made one mistake and they're like, oh my God, I hope I don't make a second mistake. And then they made a second mistake and it just compounded. And it's that mentality that let, I keep making mistakes. It's going to happen. They're waiting for the timeout. That's that's how it felt like to me. And, and it just it's frustrating because honestly, those were mistakes. If you did not commit, they would not have gone out in transition, moved the ball, rotated and, and, and blossomed into a 16-0 run. It may have been limited just in an 8-0 run. And also, just frankly, just calling a timeout to kind of bring some guys back in to give you some stability. Um, bringing Shangun and Jalen back in to run a little empty dribble handoff maybe to kind of settle things down, right? It just there, – there's some sometimes in, in situations like this, I just kind of question, what is the purpose? You, know, you want your players to learn. You want them to figure it out. But if – if part of it is also just making mistakes, easy mistakes, possession after possession, at some point you have to call it. Call a timeout, regroup, figure out what's going on. Because odds are, and this has been the case besides the two Spurs games, most of your games have been out of reach by the end of the third quarter. You're not saving your timeouts for really anything, right? Especially with a young team like this. Use it early. Establish an identity of what you're going to play like during that game. Don't allow mishaps or defensive lapses. And come back. Right. I mean, I just I, I just think it's it's something at this late of the season we've seen a lot more of. And what, what really didn't help matters, unfortunately, is it, it's not even like by the end of the second quarter, they were completely out of this game. It's just I feel like this Rockets team has so many moments where they cave and give the momentum to the other team. For and sure. one of the momentum moments was Mikhail Bridges draining a three at the buzzer of halftime, right? So the, so now the Nets go up five in into the halftime period. They've got all the momentum swinging their way. And then to compound and make things make matters worse, to compound the issue, Jabari Smith Jr. frustrated, upset with himself, upset with, you know, whatever, the, the defensive rotations on that play. And he slams the basketball down on the floor. 
it gets whistled for a technical because you know it, you know overt gestures whatever the whatever the buzzword terminology was you know for it a couple of years ago by the officials and so then the nets get you know, a free throw off of that um, to start. So then they go up six, right? To start the third quarter, they're scoring points and the clock isn't even running. It always feels bad. So it was one of those where it's just, it's a young team and you have so you have these moments that just build on themselves over the course of a game where you're like, ah, like, okay, another time where you shoot yourself in the foot, another one, another one. Boom. Another one. <laughs> like that's basically kind of what it felt like over the course of the game. I did, find it interesting right so one of the things that Silas did try this game and we, we've seen it intermittently throughout the season was Jabari Smith Jr. at the five spot and when they run Jabari at the five right you know Jabari at the five Tari KJ they, they get that kind of super switchy versatile lineup out there I get it in theory but Ali Khan I have a I have a pretty big concern at this point about Jabari's ability to defend on the perimeter uh-oh I know where this is going and I, I have a pushback for you, but go go ahead and make, okay, make okay. go ahead and make your point, Jeff. I just I don't think that he's not capable of being a good perimeter defender at all. Like I think I think he's got all the tools to get there, but he is right now, present day Jabari, is really stiff. He doesn't really at times when he's closing, really oftentimes when he's closing out, he doesn't get low into a defensive stance. He gets blown by very easily when he's closing out on the perimeter. And so when you're switching everything. And when guys are having to rotate or recover, I mean, sometimes on the switches it works because when he has his man like right in front of him, he can be good. There are still times when he gets blown by with his man right in front of him, which those moments are also concerning too. But the times when he has to rotate out to the perimeter, like he doesn't ever rotate out in a good defensive stance. And then because of that, guys just zoom right by him. And then it's the next guy up who has to... So I, I think it's... It's a bit of a concerning trend. Nothing that I don't think can't be fixed over time or fixed with better coaching, a better understanding of defensive principles, but it's just something that I'm picking up on that, that does kind of concern me a little bit. I, I, I'm Before I bring out your uh, – talk about your point, I want to highlight two quotes from Steven Silas. I got this from um, my buddy Adam Spolin of Sports Radio 610. He transcribed these two quotes. Silas said, we have to close out. We have to sprint to our closeouts. They have so much shooting on the floor with these guys. We have to be attentive to that shooting. Later, when you later, he said, when you don't corral the ball that forces you to help, then once you're in help and you're in rotation against a team that has so much shooting, you're going to give up a ton of threes. And we did. Honestly, a lot of their issues and you talked about is, is just closeouts technique. When you were closing out and I'm doing this physically for our YouTube watchers and I'm going to describe it um, verbally is you put one hand in the air, whatever your dominant hand is, right? You put your right hand in the air, right? And then your other arm And you is, put your left hand in the air and you shake it all about? No. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't with the whip and nene, but not that. <laughs> but, no, but in all honest, and honestly, no, nah, don't, don't embarrass me like this, Jackson. But um, one, one hand in the air, palm out. Other hand, palm out as well. That's near your waist. And you're crouching low. You're getting your knees bent, getting in position – to be able to lunge and close out without jumping into the offensive player or jumping to the side of the offensive player, staying in front and your, your knees are helping you. Uh, if they low that you are in position to be able to go either way defensively, depending on how the offensive player attacks that close out. What I saw from summer league, what I saw early in the season was Jabari had moments when he was in position and he was, crashed down, he was able to stay in front. Now, I'm not saying Jabari needs to – I don't think right now he's ready to get either based off kind of how you talk about him being stiff and just uh, and maybe his adductors or hip strength or all these different things is not there yet for where he needs to be. But he doesn't necessarily have to lunge into the defender. He can stay two, three feet back, allow his length to be able to help him, you know, stay stay with an offensive player if they drive but stay back a little bit. When he occupies space with his legs and hands, he takes away driving lanes. He takes away those gap. He takes away those gaps for offensive players. Nobody's asking him to always lunge at a, at a shooter. And I think if you're going to ask him to do that and force him to lunge at a shooter and, and get in front with his body, that's just not where he's at right now. Like you said, until he can improve his ability to maneuver um, in those spaces, but I think if you're if you're asking him in the middle of the floor to stay in front, 
I think that's what you can see. I think if you go back to that run, the Rockets made to end the third quarter where Jabari was at the five. There was one moment on a switch where he was going against a Nets ball handler and he wasn't attacking a closeout, but he was a switch and staying in front middle of the floor. I think where he's best as a defender is when he's in the middle of the floor, not having to go over a screen, not having to jump back and lunge at a spot up shooter, but occupying space and playing gaps and kind of taking away advantages maybe for an offensive player to get into the paint. So how do you do that? Well, there's different defensive things you can do to make that happen. But one key thing here is, like I said, is just don't put Jabari in a situation where he has to be able to run at someone. He's just not there yet. It's not that he won't get there. I think he will. I think biomechanically, the Rockets will work with him. Player development works on biomechanics, especially with technique defensively. I think over the course of the season, you want to see flashes we have. I think in order for him to get that down, Pat, and be able to see that into next season, he's going to need that summer. And I know for sure that he'll work on that moving forward. Coming up, final takeaways from this Rockets Nets game. What else do we see out of other guys on this roster? Maybe we'll talk a little. We will talk a little bit about Jabari Smith Jr. offensively in this game as well as some of the offensive struggles from Kevin Porter Jr. What we saw out of Tari Eason and Jay Sean Tate off the Rockets bench coming up in just one moment. But first, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. We're in the final stretch of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, three-pointers, drains, dunks, six-man of the year, MVP, finals odds, you take your pick at what you want to bet on. Right now, you can take a look at the NBA Finals odds. Give you some examples here. The Bucks leading the way at plus 320. The Celtics right there at plus 320 as well, tied up for the favorites to win the finals. Then you got the Phoenix Suns in third place at plus 440. The Nuggets at plus 700. And rounding out the top five, you have the Golden State Warriors at plus 1,500. So for all those odds, don't miss a chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, Alicon, as we are diving into our final segment here at Locked on Rockets, I do have to ask uh, for all of our listeners, for you, have we done our, 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 our sacred ritual here, which is pray for Victor, pray for Victor every day here at Rockets Watch. It's got to be done. Inshallah. There we go. I love it. There's some, some, some oomph behind it, some energy. All right. Um, I, I think Jabari in this game, we, we did talk about Jabari's defense there, some of the concerns that have kind of sprouted up recently for me. But offensively in this game, this might have been one of his better offensive performances in a while. Still not fantastic, but a much more encouraging performance given just his shot profile, his shot diet, the attempts he was getting in this game, 15 points, three six right. of 13. Yeah, three of seven from downtown. You like that. He had eight boards. Um, I did like, I, I sort of, I don't know. I sort of liked some of the attempts that he got that were inside the arc. Some of them felt a little rushed, but he had multiple opportunities inside the arc where he was able to get to kind of like just his, what was, you know, his, kind of his patented, like, turnaround fade at Auburn didn't hit many of them, if if at all any of them, actually, now that memory serves. But I like him getting those opportunities because I feel like, and this has been, a you know, a topic of contention, I guess, as of late, you know, amongst Rockets fans or something we've discussed regarding Jabari's struggles. But I feel like just, you know, he's so much taller and longer than every other player he plays against, like, Oftentimes, the the defender that he gets matched up with isn't even like a true four in the by the NBA standards, right? So many teams run like a, a a five or a pseudo five, and then a bunch of wings and like a ball handler. And Jabari's getting matched up with a lot of wings. Oftentimes, like in this game, he's matched up with wings, right? He's not, you know, Claxton's guarding Shangun. He had you know Johnson or Bridges on him at points in the game. So or or Dorian Finney Smith. Those are all wings. He could shoot over all of those guys. So. I would love to see him get some opportunities where he can get to his comfort spots and not necessarily have to put the ball on the floor, make a move, create for himself, just elevate yeah. and shoot over a defender. You know, you know, um, there's there's a term 
whenever you play down to your competition, like teams play down to their competition, right? If there's a good team, they may play down to a lesser team. I think sometimes Jabari plays down to size. And what I mean by that is he's long, man. He's tall. He's long. But whenever he's matched up against a wing, I feel like he crouches down and tries to match the size of the wing. Maybe un- it probably not probably definitely unintentionally, but it's something that he does, which negates his length and ability to be able to use his high release point to get a shot off, especially when he's near the basket. When he's backing somebody down, sometimes he 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 hunches over, he crouches down a little bit, and I think to a point where it negatively affects him. Wait, wait, are you saying we have a head huncho now? Oh God, I'm the head huncho. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Oh my god! I got, I, you know, oh this my. Is, is, is this our is that, is that our first mention of uh, of KPJ today? It is. It is our first mention. Of, well, oh, well, actually, well, no, no, well, no. Well, I, well, I mentioned KPJ earlier. He didn't have the best offensive game from the floor, but I have liked what I've seen actually out of him since he came back from injury. Yeah. Well, and we'll get to KPJ, but just to finish my point on Jabari, he's so long, right? That you're that you're expecting him to be able to just get his shot off for anybody. And give you an example of that. The Rockets ran a couple three-man actions, and I'll get get to it in, in, in more in a bit. But there were points where Jabari, with his high release point, just stood straight up in the air, hands above his shoulders over whoever was defending him, and threw a nice entry pass to Shangun from the top of the key. He's able to do that from there. He's able to knock down threes from there. What changes when you get down low? Yes, the players are more straight up in the air and they're closer to the basket. But my God, you are tall. There's no need to crouch down and get lower than somebody who's much shorter than you. Um, that That's something I know will get better with strength and with just more, more muscle that he's going to add on upper body wise. But, you know, it's just something I want to see him do. And he did that actually tonight, though, Jackson. He had moments where he was like, you know what? I am longer than these guys. I am bigger than these guys especially in my size. Let me get the rebound and go straight back up and dunk it. No, don't let me, you know, fade away or push uh, push back. Let me go into the contact, go in, right? I think it's the same thing that Jalen used to do last year. Jalen Green struggled attacking contact because he would try to avoid it. He would try to, like, you know, contort his body away from it. Which he I still does so. sometimes, but he's gotten he significantly sometimes. better at just e- accepting the muscle. Yes. And, yeah. and, yes. Which is why he's getting those and ones. And I think, I think Jabari will have that happen to him, too. So that's why I'm patient with it. But I think Jabari needs to leverage his length to be able to take advantage of more things, and that's going to help him a lot more moving forward. You know what we're going to do? We're going to coin the term length bridge. Length bridge. He needs to use his length bridge. Leverage the length. We're just going to combine the two words, and that's a new Locked on Rockets product. It's trademark pending, all that good stuff. Um, if you use it, you owe me a million royalties. Um, all right, let's change gears here and talk a little bit about Kevin Porter Jr. Um, yeah. Because honestly, I got like, look, he had a bad. He had a rough shooting night. I, look, I, I've been very harsh on Kevin this season. I, I'll be, I will own up to that completely. But honestly, I feel like since stepping back on the court post toe injury, he's been pretty unselfish and 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 honestly, really solid when it comes to moving the basketball and pushing tempo is the big one, right? I feel like the Rockets have done a good job, even even in this game. Like the, you know, their fast rate points, it didn't quite translate. Only 13 tonight, and they've been average, uh, averaging 20, I believe, um, for the last – I mean, I don't know how many games it was I, I, I sent to you, Jackson. I, me, you and I were texting during the game. But they they had scored, I think, uh, 20 – they were averaging 20.1 fast break points over their last nine games. Over the last nine games, yeah. So oh, And tonight was only, only 13. But you're right. Post-All-Star break especially, emphasis has been push, push, push. And, and I feel like that – you know, Kevin has bought into that idea of push, push, push. And he's done, you know, and he is, again, he's a methodical guy. He likes to slow things down and get to, you know, get into his, his comfortability in the half court. Sometimes even though the Rockets are a terrible half court team. So for him to kind of buy into that and be able to kind of push the pace, he had seven dimes, only two turnovers. Again, it wasn't the best shooting night for Kevin. He he did struggle from the floor at, at times. Maybe he was forcing the issue a little bit too much, but I do think overall, I, I can't, you know, I can't access the passing stats yet because the NBA site hasn't updated, but I would venture a guess that in addition to his seven dimes, he had, I would somewhere, I would say somewhere between six to eight, potential assists as well in this game, just shots that uh, unfortunately didn't convert from his teammates. And that's kind of the, 
the version of Kevin as the point guard that I can get behind, right? A guy who is creating those and generating those opportunities for his teammates, getting to his drive and kick game, really pushing the ball in transition. So even though he struggled from the floor in this game, I overall, I didn't think he had a bad night, honestly. I thought he did relatively solid. Although we didn't see him for a single second in the fourth quarter, which I thought was pretty interesting. And it, it had to do a lot to do with um, Coach Salas going back with Jalen to start the four because of how well that lineup with Jabari at the five did. I, I have another point I want to bring up about tonight's game, and that's a three-man action I saw with Jabari, with Jalen, and with Shangun. And they ran different ty- different versions of a three-man action. They ran some Chicago action. They ran some 21 series. Um, and, and for those who may not know uh, what those sets are, we've gone over those before in previous Locked on Rockets, especially film room episodes. Um, and if you want to learn more about those, you can Google it's 21 series or Chicago action NBA, just Google those things, or you can reach out to me on Twitter. I can kind of go into a more just to save time here, but essentially in those actions, you involve three people, um, two ball handlers in this case, which are Jabari and Jalen and then the screener, which is Alper and Shangun. And it kind of does a couple different things. It puts Jabari in a situation where he's going to be on the wing or in the corner for a three gives Jalen the ball with a chance to attack or give the ball back up to either Jabari or Shangun, and it gives Shangun a more of a free line drive or, or a free line cut to be able to establish good position for a post entry pass. And they they ran this set in the second quarter when they were making a little bit of push after that sixteen zero run. And here are some results that I I, I made down in my note, notebook. Um, there was a post entry pass to Shangun, resulted in a score. There was a three. There was a drive by Jalen that resulted in free throw. So one of each. Kind of happened there. And I really like that action because number one, it puts Jabari in movement, allows him to be involved in the action and also have confidence because he's not just standing there in the corner. But if he starts to possession in the corner, then lifts up to the wing, he's, you know, he's in rhythm. Or if he starts to position on the wing and and kind of goes towards the corner based off the movement and the action, he goes from there. And also when Shangun posts it up, both Jalen and Jabari were the fail-safe options one pass away for open shots. Oftentimes, the Rockets are just not capable yet, the young players, of making cross-court passes. And so they sometimes just make the simple pass. But having two of your best sh- spot-up shooters theoretically there next to Shangun to be able to be a fail-safe option is a great asset. And so um, I definitely wanted to highlight those things. And I'm really excited to kind of see what are some more variations we can include, especially if Jabari is going to continue to shoot like he is. Jabari in his last, I think, three games is shooting almost 55% from the field. The eight games prior to the last three games, he was only shooting 30% overall. And so I think he's starting to shoot more than 50. If he's starting to shoot better, he's more confident because he's a lot more involved in the offense, especially with the movement. I think it's going to open a lot more things for him and also for Jalen and Shangun to be able to get going as well. Confidence is definitely a big part of Jabari's game, and and that's been one of the drums that I've been beating all season. Is just yeah, he's he's struggling, missing some shots, but you got to find ways to still involve him offensively. You can't just you know throw him in the corner and say, all right, he's going to miss the shots anyways. We're just going to tuck him away and try to hide him offensively. That's not what you do. You got to find a way to inspire your third or third overall pick to break out of this slump, and that might not necessarily mean an increase in shot attempts or volume. It might just mean you know let him let him touch the ball in some possessions, right? Let him be involved in some of these actions. Let him feel like he's more part of the offense moving forward in some of the actions like you described the Chicago thing and, and all of that so that he kind of is in rhythm, right, and can maybe feel a little bit better about some of these opportunities. The last thing that I wanted to highlight here from this game, uh, Tari Eason, Jay Sean Tate off the bench. Tari Eason does what Tari does. He comes off the bench. He's kind of a one man, one man wrecking crew at times. But Jay not Sean his Tate, best game tonight. Not Tari's not his best game tonight. But that's you know he he's been having a really good last five games. I think Tari will look at the film tonight and learn from it, especially because of the defensive assignments he had and some of his issues especially with rotations, he was off a little bit. But and the to say, fouls. Yeah. He picked up four fouls in like 60 seconds of game time between like the end of the third quarter and the top of the fourth. Like He, he just wasn't in the proper positions. And also his teammates were also not totally, you know, they are they are also at fault. But this wasn't just the this wasn't the best Tari game for him. It wasn't, but, but you know Tari will bounce back. He's he's you exactly. know a total workhorse. The other guy, the, the, I want to give some flowers to Jay Sean Tate because in a game that the Rockets did lose um, by what was the final score a twenty two point deficit. Um, Jay Sean Tate was a plus two 
in his 22 minutes. He was court. good running point. Whenever he was in there, especially without KPJ, and he was the one pushing the tempo. You, you brought up KPJ earlier with tempo. I want to give credit to Jay Sean Tay. I think Jay Sean does a great job because what Jay Sean does compared to other people is not only can handle the ball, um, but he can also score. He has a good left hand. And if early in the shot clock, the first seven seconds or eight seconds, if he's able to touch the paint, he's going to put a shot up. And odds are with the left hand, he's probably going to make it. Look, the guys that really put in work in this game, obviously we spent a good chunk of time talking about Jalen Green, Alper, and Shingun. They were very solid in this game. Alpi was a plus minus zero. Jalen was a plus one. Uh, and then JT was a plus two in their minutes, right? And then you look at, yeah. you know, the the issues elsewhere in the lineups, right? The lineup that was on the court at the top of the second that got completely blown out and, you know, gave up that 16-0 run, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jay Sean Tate, it, here's, but here's the... The catch twenty two with the Jay Sean Tate situation. Yes, he's a capable backup backup ball handler, backup point guard, if you will. He can basically play any of the five positions you want him to play on the court. He's he's that versatile as a player. Um, issue being when you are dedicating the backup guard minutes to Jay Sean Tate, you are no longer getting a look at uh, Ty Ty Washington, and that's very disappointing. Is this this seems like it's going to be the trend moving forward because Steven Silas very much feels like he's coaching for wins at this point, just to bolster his resume however much he may be able to between now and the end of the rocket season and yeah. whatever may lie in the future for him and this is one of those concerns where you've got a coach who it very much feels like he's on the way out and he is now doing whatever he can in his power to coach and coach to win and he's not necessarily coaching for maximum development at this point and now it's you know Ty Ty Washington has kind of been sacrificed because of that so we've seen a couple games in a row now Jay Sean Tate is the backup point guard no Ty Ty Washington minutes and Maybe that changes. Maybe it's depending well, I, I on think matchups. To be fair, to be fair, I, I think today's game, especially the Nets, switch so many things, and Ty Ty is very good at attacking defenses that have a big involved. I think it it, it made sense uh, to have Jay Sean in there, especially to push the pace and not allow the Nets to get into a set defense. But that being said, I I understand there there needs to be more Ty Ty Washington. You need to see him play a lot more to be able to get the development. And I'm I'm just a big fan, but the fact of the matter is. It's not that Ty Ty doesn't deserve the minutes. It's just that there's so many players that they need to get an idea about, and Ty Ty is one of them. Ty Ty just needs to play. He well, just needs and, reps and, concerning how much, how, how little he's been able to play this season last. And and, uh, and again, I fully agree with your point. And again, it, it was about the matchup. Jay Sean Tate made a lot of sense in this one, but that's the problem is, is Silas was coaching this game with the explicit intent to try and win the game. And that's why the Rockets essentially ran an eight man rotation. Um, Garuba got, didn't even crack 10 minutes in this game. They basically ran three bench guys and that was Tate, Tari and Josh Christopher. Um, so that's, that is a little concerning, right? Like Ty Ty, regardless of the matchup, right? Should still be getting his 10, maybe 15 minutes a night. You want to see and... how he does against switches too, because he's shown a propensity to be able to beat switches yeah. previously uh, in previous games. Absolutely. Sure. So, uh, you know, what, fine, that was just final observation for me. But with that, Ali, kind of look, we did our prayer at the top of the segment. We got to see if that prayer actually worked. Uh, we'll squeeze in an extra prayer here at the end. Pray for Victor. Pray for Victor. We're going to roll this. Law, inshallah. All the Where, where's it going to land, Ali? Khan? What's your prediction? I think it's going to land two. I don't think it's going to be a Victor. I think it's going to be a four. A four? All right, here we go. We're going to spin it. I, I, I broke the software again, guys, so I can't for the YouTube side. I'll just announce it. <gasps> Oh, okay. Right in the middle. Wow. I said two. You said four. Sandwich in the middle. Um, Number three. Number three overall. That's not a... You missed out on the two guys at the top. It's not a horrible outcome. Um, Indiana jumped up five spots to number one. San Antonio's at number two. So that's the... So I guess Wimby is getting sent to Indiana. Um, And then Rockets at three. Pistons at four. Charlotte at five. And Orlando all the way down at six. So that does it for our tankathon spin. No Wimbenyama, unfortunately. We did not pray hard enough. Pray for Victor. Oh, my. With that, Ali Khan, you know the drill. Let everybody know where to track you down at. <laughs> he, he, can't, he can't handle it when I chain them together. Because, see, I can I can do this, too. Like, I can go. Pray for Victor. Boom. Another one. <laughs> like, just. <laughs> you know, there's a video of Alper and Shangun saying, inshallah. I think that needs to be added to the sound. Oh, board. oh, that's going to get added ASAP. All right, that'll be on the board by the next time we record. Wow. That is a that is a promise. But Alicon, do the drill. You know, do the thing. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Rockets underscore Insider. Make sure you're following us at Locked On Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. That was sweet to see. Better than you, Jackson. 
That's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, thank you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also available on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Drop your thoughts in the comments about Jabari's struggles, you know, both offensively and defensively. Give me your thoughts on on what's going on with Jabari. Also, don't forget, tell me your favorite of the two Jalen Green posters because... Those were absolutely ridiculous. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. And we look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.